So thank you again for joining us today. Um, I've got a really exciting session lined up that I'm looking forward to. Um, before we begin this session, I'll just let you know um, a few housekeeping bits. Um, just to let you know, the, the chat function is available. So if you have any questions um, as Michael is going through the presentation, feel free to pop those in um, and hopefully we'll have some uh, time to go back to them at the end of the presentation. Um, we do have another session that's coming up in a few weeks time, which is on the 13th of April, and this is a live chat session, um, and it's more aimed at the applicant or the application side of thing, the processing side of things. So if you have any queries or questions relating more to that side of things, um, then I would encourage you to come along to that session. Uh, we will be emailing all this information out to you in the kind of coming weeks, so just keep an eye on your inbox uh, and please do join us for that session if you'd like to. Um, we are also recording the session today as well, so we will also share this with you so you can come back, rewatch it if you would like to. Um, but without further ado, I'll pass you over to Michael and uh, hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Rachel. Hi and welcome, everyone. I'm Mike Jennings from the Department of Development Studies, as I'm sure you know, one of the global top five departments for the study of global development and humanitarianism. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do uh, this afternoon is just give a short taste a lecture, an example of how we discuss issues and topics in our programmes. In fact, uh, about an hour ago, I just finished my lecture on this very same topic. Um, so it really is taken from the things that we are talking about as part of our teaching, part of our modules. I'll try and speak for around 30, 35 minutes and then leave time for questions at the end. So if you do have a question, uh, you know, please do ask it. So what I'm going to talk about is excuse me, humanitarian aid. So the support that is given to people in the time of crisis um, uh, in order to address suffering and need. And of course, when we're confronted with suffering, it's a natural instinct, I think, for to want to respond in any way that we can. And doing nothing, sort of simply turning a blind eye or not responding, is seen by many as morally unacceptable. When he was asked about the response to the Ethiopian famine in the mid 1980s, uh, Bob Geldof, a celebrity who's increasingly now associated with campaigns to end poverty uh, and food hunger, argued that even if just one life was saved as a result of that intervention, it was worth it. And of course, we're seeing these kind of feelings across much of Europe right now in the response to the war against Ukraine. Uh, and we can see this outpouring, this desire to help, you know, people offering homes, uh, people cooking meals for those in need, offering health support and health care and so on, drivers who are setting off across the continent to deliver supplies. But we're also likely, I imagine, to increasingly start seeing people who don't, who may have good intentions, who may want to help, but don't necessarily have anything they can specifically offer in relation to the needs that are being there turning up. Um, or organisations going without thinking about what it is that they can do rather than an organisation that is perhaps already there. <clears throat> In fact, I saw a lovely quote yesterday about the fears that this will be the latest crisis where we start to see humanitarian actors going largely to be able to plant their flag, their flag first before others can get there and then show the world that they are responding and that they care. <clears throat> and of course, in this session, I'm going to be talking about the specifics of the humanitarian crisis, where the humanitarian sector have specific legal and other responsibilities to act in particular ways, where the response has to be undertaken within a particular set of guiding principles for it to be considered humanitarian action. But responding to these kind of crises is, of course, very difficult. How can humanitarian actors ensure that they're given access by the differing sides during a conflict? How can they ensure that the aid and the support and the supplies that they're delivering and providing is only used to help those most in need rather than as a means to perpetuate or perhaps even take advantage during that conflict? And of course, how can humanitarian workers themselves be protected from violence? And these are all questions that are asked quite frequently. I want to ask perhaps a slightly different question one that is less frequently asked, but is just as important. Whether humanitarian organizations are sometimes actively causing harm by intervening in the way that they do. So to respond to the point raised by Bob Geldof, if one life was saved, 
but at the cost of many lives, what then do we think about the level of justification of a kind of intervention? So let me be really clear, what I'm not doing in this taste of lecture, what I'm not saying is that humanitarian responses, humanitarian interventions, and the humanitarian sector is bad, or that it inev in inevitably, invariably causes harm, uh, or that it should never take place, that we should stand back. What I am trying to do is to challenge assumptions, to challenge a belief that is perhaps not necessarily based on evidence, that it's always better to do something rather than to do nothing, and that the harm that occurs within the humanitarian crisis zone is always the result of external factors or factors relating to that crisis, but not related to the humanitarian response itself. So, <coughs> excuse me, because getting access to people in the midst of a crisis uh, and a conflict in particular is so difficult. A set of core humanitarian principles has emerged over the past century and a half to ensure that humanitarian actors can gain access to those uh, requiring assistance and can do so without being blocked or attacked um, and so on. And these principles are the mechanism through which humanitarian actors are defined. So actors that adhere to these principles are humanitarian actors. If they don't adhere to these principles, even if they're working to provide relief and support during a crisis, they are not part of the humanitarian sector. And there are four key principles or four core principles. The first is humanity. So the idea that human suffering must be addressed no matter where it's found. Anyone requiring assistance, regardless of any other factor, must be given it, um, no matter what they've done, no matter who they are, no matter what they think. And that this must be done in ways that respect and acknowledge human dignity. The second core principle is impartiality. So this is the idea that aid should be given purely on the basis of need, with no distinction to what side an individual might be on, uh, to their gender, to religious belief, class, political opinion, and so on. It is purely based upon need. And those who require the most urgent need are those who are living in the most uh, urgent suffering. And the third principle is neutrality. Humanitarian actors cannot take sides or be perceived as taking sides, uh, and nor can their aid support one side or another. And finally, humanitarian actors must adhere to the principle of independence. In other words, they must operate autonomously and separately from political, economic, military, or other actors. And the first thing to acknowledge is that on the first sight, these principles seem obvious and they seem fair. Uh, and I'm not necessarily challenging that. But they're also not necessarily the easiest principles uh, or adhering to them is not necessarily as easy in practice as it might sound just from their basic definitions. You know, for example, impartiality. The Red Cross has already apologized for refusing to speak out about their knowledge of what was going on in the German concentration camps during the Second World War. Uh, they've acknowledged that their attempt to remain impartial in order to keep access to be able to go to these camps and provide support was the wrong decision to take. But in other crises, both Red Cross and Médecins Sans Frontières and other actors have been criticized for failing to speak out. For example, during the Rwandan genocide, both of those organizations presented it as a conflict between two sides rather than a genocidal campaign being run by the government, uh, which was both instigator and director of the violence. MSF are more willing to speak out and indeed were established precisely because they wanted to be able to speak out where they noted egregious human rights abuses. But of course, the decision as to when it is possible, when it is advisable to speak out is difficult. But despite the practical issues, perhaps sometimes the ethical issues of adhering to these values being difficult, being challenging, they are seen as being essential to gaining access, to building trust with all sides and therefore being allowed by all sides to gain access to people in need. It's critical or it's seen as critical for enabling humanitarian agencies to operate in those conflict zones as neutral actors who are favoring no one who are undermining no particular side, combatants have few acceptable reasons 
for denying them entry to meet those most in need. And of course, it can help protect the humanitarian workers themselves from attacks, as they are not supposed to be seen as belonging to any particular side, so they are not considered to be legitimate targets for violent attacks. They're providing care for all, regardless of what particular side those particular communities and individuals might fall upon. But I think there are ways in which we can see humanitarian actors, even where they're trying to adhere to these principles and their interventions can sometimes cause harm. And the question arises as to whether in these instances, they should have been doing something either radically different, they should have not been there at all, or some other option. And I'm gonna run through a few examples to explain what I mean. So for many people of my generation, the, respond, the response to the Ethiopian famine of the mid 1980s was a moment of, of global political awakening. So it was inspired by a series of news reports by the journalist Michael Burke and the cameraman, cameraman Mohammed Amin, who depicted uh, people, particularly children, in the midst of anguish, starvation, dying from lack of food. And the impact of what was being described led to a global outpouring of support and the influx of humanitarian actors. The Live Aid concerts raised at uh, the time $127 million, which is about $400 million in today's terms, so almost half a billion dollars, which was immense, That one of the, one of the biggest sums ever raised from a single event uh, to that date. And humanitarian actors, NGOs, and other organizations flooded into the country to provide food relief for those in distress. The problem was that this was not a famine that was caused by food shortage, as was the impression given both by the news reports and by the campaigns that were being run by these humanitarian organizations. It was a famine that had been caused deliberately by the government in the midst of war. It was using famine as a weapon of war in order to undermine the rebellious areas in northern um, uh, Ethiopia, in Tigray and in Eritrea, which was then part of the Ethiopian state. And indeed, if anyone's interested, uh, there are a considerable number of parallels between what was going on in the mid 1980s and what's going on right now in Ethiopia, including the ways in which famine, starvation, food shortages and food aid have become weaponized as part of that conflict. And the problem was that aid agencies were bringing in vast amounts of food aid in order to bring it to those people who are most in need. But because it was being brought into the country, it became a resource that could be manipulated and used. And we know that the government was able to um, divert some of that um, some of that food, some of those food supplies to its military. It also meant that it didn't have to spend so much of its own money on providing food aid to its own citizens and to its military and could divert that spending to military spending, to buying weapons in order to continue to prosecute the war. And perhaps most egregiously, um, the government, uh, the, the humanitarian organizations that were there, the NGOs, provided support for a government implemented resettlement policy. The government said this was about moving people from the drought ridden lands to more productive areas and therefore enabling them to become more resilient uh, and to be better fed and to meet their development needs. But actually it was a quite transparent government war policy to denude the areas of the north of supporters for the rebel TPLF um, and thereby undermine support or undermine the capacity of the rebel uh, fighters to carry on with the war. At least 300,000 people died as a result of that resettlement policy, which wouldn't have been possible without the complicity, without the engagement of humanitarian organizations who provided the food aid that allowed it to take place. So this leads to two questions. Firstly, were the humanitarian actors, or this leads to a question, were the humanitarian actors actually aware of what was going on. And if they weren't, if this was kind of an unwitting complicity, then shouldn't they have been aware of what's going on? Being neutral is surely more than just a, a passive act of not taking sides. Surely it requires an in-depth of analysis and understanding of what is exactly going on, what has created that crisis 
in order that you can respond in particular ways and act in particular ways and shape your interventions in ways that are truly neutral, not just neutral on paper. <clears throat> and if NGOs were aware, and we know that many were aware from looking at their internal papers and their internal debates that were going on about how they respond, was it ethical of them to present the famine in the ways that they did as a classic famine caused by failing crop um, harvests, food shortages, and an absence of enough food in the markets? And how could they justify participating in a resettlement campaign that was nakedly political, that was nakedly very clearly linked to the war effort? <clears throat> and of course, these issues are not something related to history. We can see this very clearly in um, operations that go on in the midst of conflicts. Because the challenge for humanitarian action is that bringing any resource into a country, into a conflict rather, makes that resource part of the crisis economy. And these resources can sustain crises by allowing sides to keep fighting. They can create new conflicts by becoming themselves uh, a, a, a source, a site of conflict over who gets to control that particular resource. In Somalia, for example, in the early 1990s, the food aid that was brought in by the charities, the humanitarian actors, was distributed by the warlords who were establishing control over Somali society. The humanitarian organizations argued that this was the only realistic way of getting food aid to those most in need, and perhaps they were right. But others have argued that what it served to do was reinforce the power of the warlords, and in doing so, perpetuate the conflict for a long time that caused far more immense suffering uh, to a far greater number of people. And Syria has presented one of the most complex of emergencies, and one of the most complex of and challenging of environments in which to work. And here too, we can see how food aid has been used as a weapon of war, how the attempts to remain neutral are undermined by the fact that food becomes a resource to be used and exploited by all sides. Food aid in the government held areas was required to be channeled through government approved organizations, which allowed the Syrian government to be able to claim that it was meeting its obligations of being a state, that it was looking after the needs of its people. It also meant that it needed to spend less of its own resources on purchasing and securing food supplies and could divert more to the military effort. The government caused obstacles, restricted access to rebel held areas for the very obvious reason that it meant that those people who um, were living in the rebel held areas increasingly opposed the authorities in those areas because they were starving and they couldn't get access to supplies and they blamed the authorities rather than the Syrian government who was the cause of those obstacles. And supplies were diverted from civilian to military use by all sides. The Islamic State, for example, insisted that it supervise a large proportion of any food supplies that were being handed out, and that at least a third of them had to be handed out in boxes that were marked or branded with the Islamic State logo, giving the impression that this was their supplies. They were the ones who were providing food aid to people living in the territories that they concerned, they, they controlled. So there is this real question, I think, to be asked about the balance between the potential for unintended harm caused by humanitarian operations against the assistance that they can provide. It's not an easy balance. Uh, it'll be very difficult to judge, but it's a question nevertheless that needs to be asked. And I think there is a question about whether humanitarian organizations are actually asking it sufficiently robustly and transparently. There are other problems, too, with um, the way humanitarian organizations operate, and in particular, a question as to whether they are operating for the interests of those most in need, or perhaps for the interests of themselves as organizations and for fundraising. In July 1994, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, the RPF, defeated uh, and overthrew the genocidal government of Rwanda. And as the RPF swept towards Kigali, the government or the fleeing, now fleeing government called upon the remaining Hutu in the country to leave, saying that if they didn't, the new government would seek reprisals, would seek vengeance for the genocide that had occurred. And around 2 million people left the country within a very short space of time. In one particular area, 
in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, Goma. Around 850,000 people arrived in the space of two, three days. And it was one of the largest emergencies of the time. Um, up to 200 organizations uh, turned up to provide support, to set up health centers, tents, provide food, uh, and so on. And around 1.5 billion pounds was spent over the course of the year just on this uh, operation alone. And of course, it received huge interest from the media, led to campaigns by humanitarian organizations asking for donations. And, and this is where I think it becomes ethically incredibly problematic. Those organizations drew a direct link between the experience of people who had just gone through a genocide and were now fleeing a government and living in vulnerability and in very poor circumstances in these refugee camps in Goma. But the problem was it wasn't the people who had just been through genocide who had fled. The camps were filled with people who, many of whom, perhaps not all, had been complicit in the genocide. And in amongst those civilians were also the Hutu militia that had carried out and directed the genocide. So this makes it incredibly problematic. Humanitarian organizations were misrepresenting and deliberately misrepresenting, I think, the cause and the nature of the particular crisis justified, they argued, by raising a large amount of funds from a public who are appalled at what had been going on and wanted to do whatever they could to help. But it's worse than that. It's worse than just a misrepresentation because there are many people, and this is a, this is a, a site for debate, so I'm certainly not saying this is the only perspective, but there are many who argue that because these camps were set up and brought in large amounts of resources, because the way the camps functioned gave the Hutu militias, the military commanders, uh, not only an increased element of power, but a, a population over whom they could exert their control. It allowed the militias to rearm and to acquire support and to carry on a campaign of violence against the Rwandan government, which led to more than a decade of instability and violence across the whole of the Great Lakes region, which has probably killed, let's say, we don't know, but you know, at least five, possibly even eight million people since the mid 1990s. Some people working for NGOs acknowledged the complicity and the problems of doing this. So Kevin Watkins, who worked for Oxfam and wrote a report for Oxfam, talked about the fact that it's an invidious position because they are delivering aid in order to support people through structures controlled by the very people responsible for the crimes committed in Rwanda. It's difficult to imagine, Watkins writes, a graver abuse of international assistance. Ronnie Broman, who was then the director or the president rather of Médecins Sans Frontières, one of the big humanitarian organizations went further. The humanitarian intervention, he writes, far from representing a bulwark against evil was in fact one of its appendages. That's a really strong criticism about what was going on. And it underpins why so many people think that this was one of the, the worst examples of a humanitarian intervention, that not only was not providing the help that it sought to, but created immense harm in the wake of its operation. And some have argued that actually the emergency was more used by humanitarian agencies as a way to boost their profile and their funding than the actual understanding of the necessity to respond and respond in ways that might have mitigated or minimized those harms. So as Mills writes, large, highly publicized humanitarian crises can be the perfect opportunity to raise enough funds, not only for the expenses for that particular crisis, but for the long-term survival of the organization. The, the high publicity area of Goma Mills writes was turned into a situation where NGOs had to have a presence, even at the expense of analyzing the context in which an NGO might be operating. And I think that goes back to that quote that I started off with, talking about um, the fact that NGOs and other organizations are now seeking to flood into Poland and, and areas bordering Ukraine to plant their flags first, to show that they are there, they are responding, they care, perhaps in order more to raise their profile than for any real meaningful support that they can offer. Terry writes, Rwanda provided a dramatic, well-publicized show of human suffering 
in which the enemy was a virus and the savior was humanitarian aid. So he's referring there to a, a cholera epidemic that swept through the camps and, and, the, and the, the, the idea that these people could only be saved through humanitarian aid from the global north. So a classic example of that kind of white saviorism that we've started to increasingly talk about in recent years. And we can see areas where humanitarian responses have not necessarily inadvertently caused harm, but have directly caused harm through terrible failures in the way that they operate. The response to the Haiti earthquake of 2010, for example, one of the largest humanitarian responses to that point, so $5 billion was spent in the first few months alone, but one which was seen as the humanitarian sector getting it badly wrong in ways that caused harm, prolonged the suffering of people, and did very little to restore Haiti to any sense of resilience or self-reliance or ability to cope with future shocks as we have now seen over the successive decade. Communications between various humanitarian organizations, NGOs, the United Nations, and other donor organizations was extremely weak. There was hardly any coordination of efforts, which meant that some areas received almost no support, whereas other areas had large number of NGOs replicating the work of others where it wasn't necessarily uh, appropriate. They could have done, you know, they could have spread it out and therefore ensured a more even uh, and better response. There was very weak engagement with local communities. Major meetings where decisions were being made about what the needs were and what should be done were held in English in a French-speaking country. So that meant there was little thought to how they could engage with local organizations that were there, that were seeking to work, that required resources, but certainly had the capacity and the skill level to implement um, any kind of response. Many of the incoming humanitarian organizations were motivated by genuine and admirable desire to help, having seen the suffering, but actually didn't have the experience or the knowledge to be able to do so. They hadn't dealt with emergencies on this scale before, and so actually required a lot of support. They diverted support to them rather than to the people and the organizations who most needed it. Many organizations didn't think about their own needs. They came in without adequate shelter or without adequate food supplies, so therefore drew on the resources that were coming in for the crisis. And volunteers were able to come and engage in activities for which they had no way of proving their credentials. So we know that volunteers were providing medical services despite not having and certainly not needing to show any medical, medical qualifications, something that would be totally illegal in pretty much every country uh, outside of a crisis. So why was this okay in a crisis that people with insufficient medical training, without the legally recognized credentials to be able to do the things they were doing, why was it okay for them to be doing it just because this was in the midst of a crisis? And whilst the example of Haiti may be egregious, it isn't unique. And that's what makes it, this isn't just a kind of a case of a, 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 an operation that got it wrong. These mistakes are repeated to different levels of seriousness, to different extents, to different scales in humanitarian operation after humanitarian operation, which suggests that there is something institutional, structural, rather than just being individual one-off failures. Um, and these, the reason they matter so much, of course, is because you know, the consequences for already vulnerable people can be catastrophic. So why are we allowing these to go on? Why are we giving the intentions, the good intentions of the humanitarian sector, um, a kind of a get out of jail free card by saying, you know, whatever you do, just as long as you're doing something, that's okay, but ignoring um, the uh, needs of the most vulnerable people. I can see there's a question in the chat. I've, I've almost finished, let me finish, and then I'll come back to that uh, question, but I, I will come back to it. And I think this links into these uh, a much wider issue of power and debates around decolonization, racism, uh, and our issues around power inequalities and inequities within the humanitarian sector. And I'm not suggesting these are only in the humanitarian sector. What I'm suggesting is that just as we look at these kind of issues in the private for-profit sector, in the development sector, in universities, in schools, in the police, in government, and so on, we also need to look at humanitarian actors because they have considerable power. And therefore, they need to be challenged and questioned. So there are questions like, you know, are humanitarian principles being used to exclude others and defend the power 
and the role of humanitarian actors? Do we focus more on the intentions and values of humanitarian organizations, their principles, rather than the needs, the experiences of affected populations and the outcomes of those operations? And how are humanitarian organizations held accountable for their actions? And this isn't something, this isn't a debate that has only been done on the outside. This is a debate that is going on within the sector as a whole. A couple of years ago, around a thousand people, a thousand staff members of Médecins Sans Frontières accused their own organization and in, in an internal letter of being institutionally racist, of failing to understand how uh, colonial frameworks and colonial pasts and neo-colonial um, ways of operating were shaping uh, their operations and their decisions and their policies in ways that could be damaging, not only to the staff with, employed by MSF, but the communities with whom they were working. So it's hard, of course, if not impossible, to look at suffering in the world and not to want to respond. And I'm absolutely not saying that we shouldn't respond, that we should just kind of shrug our shoulders and accept it and say, well, you know, whatever we do, we'll make it worse. I'm definitely not saying that. What I am saying is that we can't assume that just because humanitarian actors have good intentions, have good values that we admire and are working to a set of principles, that therefore they're not causing harm, because we, we know that simply isn't true. And we can't excuse harm on the basis that actors have good intentions. If a for-profit company causes inadvertent harm, it gets taken to court, quite rightly. It gets um, challenged. We can't simply say that just because these are not-for-profit organizations, just because they're trying to do good, they don't therefore have responsibilities and are not accountable for any harm that they may, may, they may well do. So we can't just say we admire their values and their dedication, and that is sufficient, because that prioritizes our feelings in the global north, our values, our experiences, over the lives and the experiences of those who are already incredibly vulnerable in the midst of a crisis. So how can humanitarian principles be used in ways that lessen vulnerability, empower communities, and live up to their aspirations? So of course it isn't about saying humanitarianism is bad, it isn't, it's vital. It's more necessary now than it ever has been. But it's about how it can be structured in ways and delivered in ways that preserve the human dignity of all and protect against additional harm. Okay, I'm gonna, thanks everyone. I'm just gonna, I, I will open it to questions. I'm gonna leave this slide open. I'm just gonna go back to the question that I saw was asked in the chat site. It's quite a long one. So just bear with me while I read through it. Um, so if, if you haven't got your chat uh, box up, you'll be able to see, yeah, put it up because you'll be able to see this question yourself. Um, so, right. Uh, so how, since most humanitarian crises uh, come from other countries and transnational organizations, how do we ensure the allocation of resources and track where things are going? Okay, so this is really a question about sovereignty. So, you know, there, there are, um, and, and how, can we, how can we protect states against the misuse of resources? Like the first thing to say that it isn't just states who misuse uh, resources, it's all sides within a particular conflict can and do misuse resources. Um, and I think here it's about transparency. It's about uh, ensuring that um, it is very clear what is going on, what is being delivered, um, and to where. Now, it may be hard for some uh, humanitarian organizations to do that whilst remaining independent and neutral and impartial. But of course, that may be where the role of um, the uh, international media comes in, who can report and do report uh, on many of the abuses that are going on. Um, and, you know, it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, th th there is no such thing as total sovereignty within international law. Governments don't get to do exactly what they want uh, within their territory with no consequences, or at least there is no right for them to do that. You know, there's a separate question as to whether that actually happens. There is an obligation on all sides, legal obligations on all sides, to let humanitarian actors in. That doesn't make it easy. It doesn't mean that it all necessarily happens, and it is often the result of quite fraught and tense negotiations, which can take time. But there are obligations for them to go in. So sovereignty is not an kind of unmovable uh, obstacle to humanitarian action, but you're right, it does make it difficult. And that is one of the challenges that, uh, you know, humanitarian actors can't be responsible 
uh, for the misuse of food aid, but they might be responsible if they've delivered a resource and brought it in in ways that allow for its exploitation more so than others. Um, if you want to kind of come back on that, that's fine. I, you know, it was a long question, so I, I may not have captured all of what you're asking. Um, Rachel, I'm not sure if people are able to unmute themselves and ask questions directly, but if they are, that's fine. Um, yeah, um, so she should be able to raise their hand and then I can unmute them. So yeah, if anyone okay. wants to um, chip in or add anything, do raise your hand and I'll unmute yeah. you. I just because it'll also be easier than me trying to very quickly scan through a question and pick up what I think it's about. But I, I'll, I'll keep going unless I see some hands up. Um, so someone asking if it's possible for organisations to ask for government's contribution. Um, I, I, I think the, the problem there is, and this comes back to this, um, they're trying to deal with those people in need. So there's an acknowledgement that no side is necessarily doing what it should be doing. Uh, and so it's coming in. So they're not saying it's not a bargaining in the sense of, well, if you provide this, then we'll provide that. The humanitarian principle is about if people are in need, we need to go in and address that need because no one else is doing it. So the humanitarian operation takes place because an organization, be it a government or another side, is not able to or not willing to fulfill its obligations uh, in order to address that particular need. And that might not always be um, kind of something that we might attach blame to. So, for example, if hospitals have been destroyed or if there are no essential medicines, if there just simply isn't enough food, those kind of things need uh, to be brought in. But there is normally a degree of working with those kind of organisations. And the extent to which, but in the midst of highly complex conflicts, and this is something we can see in Ukraine at the moment, um, where you know, the, you know there's, a, there's an awful lot going on. One of the things that is going on is that uh, the Russian government is seeking to present any form of support going into Ukraine, even if it's things like food aid or medical supplies, as part of a military support to the Ukrainian government. So they're denying that it's humanitarian and therefore they're blocking it on those grounds with very little kind of real credibility for that, but that's nevertheless the argument that they're making. And of course, given the power of the Russian state, given that it's kind of not stopping you know, the bombing campaign, that makes it difficult, if not impossible, for humanitarian organizations to go in. So yeah, I mean, it, it makes it very difficult. I mean, the thing I would stress, and this is true for the whole program, is that you know, there are no easy answers. You know, there are no solutions that are entirely good. There are kind of decisions that have to be made, which may be less bad than others. Everything that one does is problematic in one way or another. So the point is not to say in addressing this humanitarian response, you do this and it will be fine. Or in order to kind of work with gender and development, if you do this and everything will work it out. The programs are designed to get you to think about the questions you need to ask and to understand the contexts in which that particular issue is taking place in ways that can mean that you're more likely to do good, you're more likely to achieve the aims that you want to than not. But of course, it's incredibly complex. And in some cases, one is simply coming up against the brick wall of this is not going to be possible because either we're not being let in or the violence is too severe or whatever else it happens to be. And that makes it very difficult. Uh, so Nicola's asking, you know, how can the incentive for NGOs to prioritize, you know, good press over effective help be overcome? Again, a really difficult question. And I certainly don't want to suggest that all NGOs are driven by the need or the desire for, you know, a good press story more than anything else. And there are many NGOs that kind of have quite strong sets of principles and regulations over how they are supposed to report on a crisis, how they're supposed to represent poverty or represent a particular region. And they try to do ways, do so in ways that kind of promote human dignity rather than kind of perpetuate narratives of suffering, you know, that kind of poverty porn that people have talked about. Um, you know, the Red Cross, for example, have a very specific code on the images that are allowed to be used in their campaigns. But it is difficult. It's incredibly difficult because there, you know, whatever else we think of NGOs, they are organizations that exist by getting funding. So again, you know, there is always going to be a tension between their need to get hold of resources through their campaigns, which means tugging on the heartstrings and opening the wallets of people like us watching their campaigns and doing so in ways that show the complexity of poverty, show the complexity of engaging with these things in ways that are realistic and respectful. 
Uh, and so that, I guess, is partly our responsibility. We need to look at those campaigns. And if we think that something isn't right, we should let the NGO know. We should write and say, actually, I think what you're doing is deeply problematic. One thing, what really interesting development in recent years, and it might have been going on longer, but I've kind of noticed this more in recent years, is that diaspora groups are now increasingly vocally critical of NGOs that are representing their kind of home countries or their ancestral homes in ways that they think are misrepresenting and are engaging and working with those NGOs to try and improve that aspect. Um, but it is difficult and it requires on goodwill of NGOs and perhaps that's where we need to think about how accountability, better forms of accountability for NGOs can be created in order to provide disincentives uh, for that kind of activity. And we have got a raised hand. Okay. So, um, yes, thank you. For Rachel's talk. I will just remind everyone though that this session, this session is being recorded. So if you have any problems um, with that, then you know it's probably better to pop your query into the chat. Um, but Rachel, I'll just grant you permission now. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please do. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Michael. Though I got in a bit late, but my question is related to when you mentioned how um, humanitarian organizations can strike a balance between the principles, their values, and the needs of the actual people that they're trying to serve and then the outcomes that is expected to be seen. So my question is, how can we developmental professionals strike that balance, have a balance or equilibrium um, between fulfilling the need, the mission or vision or values or principles of an organization and the needs or actual ac outcomes of the people or beneficiaries we're trying to help out? Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. That's a really good and interesting and uh, difficult question. Um, but I think it's one that, you know, all of our students, um, current students and former students and prospective students are grappling with. That's why they're doing these kind of programs. And I think it's difficult, difficult for a number of reasons. Firstly, I think personally, I think it's absolutely essential that organizations have values. So I'm, I, and I think that organizations should work to those values. Um, and I, and I think if those values are transparent, if it is very clear what those organizational values are, then everybody knows. And so you can work within that. So, for example, if an organization says that, you know, under no circumstances will we work alongside military forces um, as part of our operation. So therefore, you know, we, we didn't go into Afghanistan in the, two, you know, the 2000s and 2010s, and we won't go into similar areas where we are we might be seen as working alongside the military on the one hand that means they're not kind of providing support where perhaps they could but on the other it's a very clear open value that everyone is aware of uh, and i think that's fine i think where it becomes more problematic is where assumptions are being made where uh, ngos are saying this is what we think the causes of poverty are and this is what we think the solutions to that poverty are and this is why i think that the, the greatest skill that an ngo or, you know development worker of any kind doesn't really matter what sector they're working in can have is about questioning and critical analysis so understanding what actually is going on in the particular context so understanding, you know, why is this a problem here um, and why, you know, I, I, not just kind of, you know, let me give an example. You know, if, if we're talking about, you know, why do people not have water, clean water supplies in a particular village? One approach would be to say, look, we tried this project in Nepal. It worked really well. So we're going to come to Cameroon and we're going to do exactly the same project and because we know it'll have the same outcome. The reality is it probably won't because you're dealing with an entirely different context, but social, cultural, economic, um, and so on. So understanding and questioning the context is really important. And listening, understanding how you listen to people, how you empower people to put forward their own ideas and to work with people so you're facilitating development rather than creating development. I think becomes really important and I think so it's those kind of skills it's the not just kind of accepting well this is the way we've always done it so you know we'll try it again regardless of the outcome but thinking about well we might do something different here because of factors x y and z because we've talked to the people and this is what they've told us and I suppose the other thing is humility um, you know the fact that you know we, we live in a world where the dominant 
development policies are shaped by the big international organizations, by kind of the World Bank, the IMF, and the big donors. And I think what they show is a remarkable lack of humility. They have absolute, well, many people, I accept that it's not true for everyone, but many of them have absolute faith in the rightness of the policies they're putting forward. Um, and don't listen to the challenges. So having humility, listening to challenges, trying to understand when things have gone wrong and why they have gone wrong is also one of those kind of critical values. And together, all of them can help make development interventions better and make everyone better uh, at doing their job. But it takes time and it takes actually quite a lot of courage uh, for people to be able to do that. But it, it's really important. So that was a really, really interesting question. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Rachel, do we have time for, because I think, I think there's another yeah, question. Yeah, we're, we're heading towards the end, but maybe if you want to wrap things up with one or two of these last questions here, and then um, if you wouldn't mind sharing your email address perhaps, or I think you yep. might have had contact details on one of the slides, then uh, any further questions. Uh, okay, well, let me just put, uh, I'm just going to put my email address in the, before I answer the questions now. Uh, Okay, so that's my email address. Um, so if you want to get in touch, you know, that's absolutely fine. I'm just, there's just two more questions that I'll, I'll address quickly in the chat. So someone is asking about international systems to regulate um, on um, uh, humanitarian aid and development. Yeah, that, that's a, it's, you know, I, yes, I think there needs to be much greater systems of regulation. Uh, which will uh, improve accountability. Uh, and the humanitarian sector has tried to put in place some regulations. There's something called the Sphere Project, which some of you might have heard about, which is an attempt to set minimum standards for humanitarian operations. And there are other kind of guidelines and practices for how NGOs should be operating in the humanitarian zone. The problem is that many NGOs are incredibly wary of regulation because they see it as perhaps a form of government control and perhaps undermining their independence. So it needs to be a way that doesn't just let these organizations off the hook and kind of mark their own homework as it were, um, but it also needs to be sensitive enough so it isn't about kind of asserting government donor control because of course the main donors, governments may then seek to misuse uh, humanitarian aid for their own purposes. I would argue, for example, that um, the European Union and the UK in their response to the migration crisis in the Mediterranean um, deliberately misused humanitarian funding in ways to protect their own migration policies rather than help save and protect those people in desperate need, kind of making their way in precarious boats across the Mediterranean. So it's difficult, yes. So yes, there needs to be something. The point is it has to be something that everyone can agree is workable and doesn't lead to the subverting of humanitarian action for just a different set of interests that might be equally or even more harmful. Uh, and then you know, finally there's a question about excessive humanitarian aid. Um, so yes, so, so I, I, a good example. So organizations who have been working on nutrition but haven't made a significant improvement despite years of aid. I think there is a danger that humanitarian aid, which is supposed to be time limited for the nature of the crisis, effectively becomes permanent. It becomes a permanent part of the system. Médecins Sans Frontières, for example, often find this. So you know, they, they um, when they have tried to move out of countries where they've been providing health care for, say, 10 or even 20 years, arguing that, you know, this is not our role. We should be you know it should be a you know either a, a donor supported national health system or a government supported national health system but they've faced incredible pushback by saying that if you leave there is nothing and that makes it very difficult and sometimes you know that can be a problem that they become more permanent than others but i think it's also worth reflecting on the fact that you know there is a huge shortfall in funds for humanitarian operations um, you know, there is something like 20 billion gap financing gap between what has been pledged by donors and what is being asked for in the various humanitarian crises funds that are going on uh, across the world right now, um, which means that, you know, in many cases, the reasons why nutrition may not have improved may not be the fault of the humanitarian organization, but may actually be a lack of or an unwillingness or a lack of engagement from the donors to be able to put in the resources that might actually make a tangible difference. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that can be a problem. Uh, and I think there are a variety of, of causes and, and potential reasons why that may occur. Um, but, you know, the, the better humanitarian organizations are aware of that and are trying to think about, you know, what is our exit strategy when 
and how will we pull out and hand over to a kind of a, a, a not humanitarian crisis system, but a, a national sustainable system for whatever it happens to be, nutrition, health, education, and so on. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, really interesting questions. As I say, if you've got any other questions, get in touch with me. If you have a question about our program or about the admission process, you can still email me because I can just pass those on uh, to the most uh, relevant person who'll be able to answer your question. Um, but I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you took something from it. Uh, and if you disagree radically with everything that I've said, that is even better. You know, we're not here to tell you what to think. What we're trying to do is to provide you some ideas so you can think for yourself, ask your own questions and come up with your own conclusions. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye now.